So I'm here today, and I'm Brian Gomez. Uh, Ginger Gomez is also here with me, and she's going to be driving as we, uh, as we walk through this presentation. Combined, we have over uh, 20 years of experience with PathPerfect, and uh, we were both in on the development of the Inventory Manager. Today, we're going to be going over inventory strategies to give you the tools you need to be successful. We're going to lecture for about 45 minutes. And at the end of the 45 minutes, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. So as I was preparing for this uh, webinar, in the uh, Museum Registration uh, Methods 5th edition here, I found this quote, which I thought Maureen did a great job with. Um, it kind of outlines the importance of doing an inventory, as well as the pain of doing an inventory. And I didn't know what Sisyphean meant, and uh, then I found out, of course, by Wikipedia, that uh, this King Sisyphus, which is a problem for me to say, um, was uh, punished and having to roll a large boulder up a hill. He was compelled to do this. Um, and that when he'd get the boulder near the top, it would roll back down to the bottom and he would have to do it again over and over again forever. And for many of us, that's what inventory feels like, that we, it's something that never ends. It's, uh, we're going to have to do it, in most cases, annually, and we're going to have to do it over and over. So. We are compelled to do inventory the same way uh, Sisyphus was compelled to move the rock. So why do an inventory? We as museum professionals, as well as the institutions that employ us, uh, are responsible for the security and the long-term care of these items. If we don't know what we have, then we cannot take care of it. So accountability is number one. Preservation and conservation money is always in short supply. Um, if we don't have a good inventory, we don't know how to give that money to the, thing, to the things that are in the most need. Uh, discovery, part of the fun, and I put fun in quotes here, um, is finding the items that we didn't even know were part of the collection. Uh, yes, it means more work in figuring out why they're part of the collection, but it is the fun of finding things. And that's our found in collection uh, lecture that we've done before in training sessions. Accessibility to the collection. Um, efficient accessibility to the collection is directly related to how good the inventory is. Can we find the item and can we get to it? And quite frankly, compliance. That with uh, most of us, we're being compelled to do this by some other uh, funding organization, government, or agency board. We have several types of inventory. And uh, the workflow or process inventory is by far the most informal. This workflow process inventory is what you do on a day-in, day-out basis by recording that you see, have moved, have put on exhibit, have um, conserved an item. So if you have the item on your desk or in the lab or are doing something to it, you are inventorying it. You're seeing it and recording that you did see it. This process, this informal process, may allow you to do uh, an inventory a lot faster. If over the course of a year you interact with one-third of your collection, well, perhaps at the end of the year you don't need to do that third again. There's also a partial or section inventory. And this might be based on something uh, physical, like a drawer or cabinet, which is the example we're going to use later. Or it might be more conceptual, that it's a collection, that you're going to inventory a collection. We have the random spot check inventory, which is great for validating assumptions. It's for uh, if you don't think that most of your collection is where it's supposed to be, you could generate a random inventory to see if that assumption is correct. It's a mathematically a good alternative to a complete inventory. And I say this for organizations who are just physically do not have the resources to do a complete inventory, a random spot check inventory, because it removes human bias, is mathematically a decent solution to a complete wall-to-wall -wall inventory. And that brings us to the complete wall-to-wall -wall inventory, which for most of us, this is what we think of when we think of inventory. And for many of us, it is required. And for many more of us, it is required annually, which is a, a daunting task. It is, uh, it is definitely rolling a boulder up a hill. So we can't really remove this process, but we hope that we can make it a little bit easier a little bit lighter, and make it so it's a little less painful. 
So what's included with the inventory manager? As we were putting the inventory manager together, we saw how it blended with our barcode inventory, or I'm sorry, our barcode printing module. And the barcode printing module allows you to print barcodes like the one you see here on the right um, of the flower sifter. Um, it allows you to print barcode labels. We also have in this inventory module a list generator, which allows you to generate lists of artifacts, either by location or randomly, or you'll see a lot more, uh, a lot more of the functionality of that shortly. We also included in this the import inventory list, which allows you to take a, um, a notepad or some other uh, document recording device and, uh, and generate a text file of the object IDs and be able to import that into PassPerfect so it can then match up those records to create an inventory list. And then there's a mass update feature that once your inventory list is created, you can then update those records with a uh, global update for fields like uh, inventory, who did it, what date they did it, maybe even changing locations or items like that. Um, one of the pictures here shows uh, a barcode wand. This is the barcode wand we're going to be using during our presentation. Um, so when you see, when you hear the little beep going off, that's the wand we're actually using. I'm not sure that image is what we're using today, but that is definitely the wand. So I want to introduce two strategies um, here and uh, talk a little bit about them. One is concept strategy number one is going into the uh, database and printing out a list of all of the items that you're sending either yourself or someone else to go find. This is the database has the data in it, and you need to go locate those items out in your collection. Strategy concept number two is a document and compare strategy, where we go out into the collection and uh, then we bring back from the collection a list of items that we found and match it against our database. Before I go any further, um, we, we, I want to launch a couple of polls here to ask some questions. All right, so what percentage of your collection is now, is now in PassPerfect? So here's what we see. Of the 157 people that are currently in our class, of which about 140 responded, this is what the answers look like, which it sounds a lot like um, what we normally hear in the Path Perfect Support Office. I mean, if you look at it, it's pretty much on average, people have about 50% of their collection catalog in Path Perfect. Um, pretty interesting. All right, so I have a second qu poll question. How long has it been since your last complete inventory? Less than 12 months, within the last three years, within the last 10 years, I don't think we ever have done a complete inventory, or I don't know, I'm new here. Very few of us have, have done the annual. Even if we look back three years, very few of us have done it. And many people think that maybe we have, have never done a complete inventory. And uh, yeah, I, I can't say that I'm too surprised, but uh, we're hoping to make that process a lot easier. All right, great information. So yeah, concept one was printing a list and going to find. Concept two is documenting the items that are out in that area and then reconciling it with your database. So what's the best strategy? Well, no single strategy is going to work for all organizations. I can't tell you that this is a one-size-fits-all deal. Um, generally, your resources are going to dictate what can be done in your allotted period of time. I want to point this third point bullet out because I think, especially now that I've seen the, uh, the statistics, that um, that it makes sense to me to say inventorying the entire collection over three years is better than inventorying the same one third of the collection year after year. Um, I think a lot of us, this project looks so big and so huge, it's hard for us to get geared up to do it. And potentially, that's because we're trying to lift one boulder up the hill every year, as opposed to one third of a boulder up the year or up the hill over the course of, uh, of three years doing three boulders. So I think this proactive planning might be a good concept to take away from this uh, this webinar in how you can at least do a better job of doing an inventory. And then the, the thing I, that we'll be teaching here, and especially in the advanced part at the end, we're going to be talking about combining the strategies doing both. The ideal is that it doesn't matter which way you go, that it's going to be close, that if you start from the database, your database is going to be uh, pretty reflective of what you have. 
but clearly for those people who have less than 25% of their collection cataloged in Path Perfect, the database is not the authority on what you own. Um, and likewise, if you start the other way, you should be able to find that in the database, but again, until it's cataloged in Path Perfect, uh, it's hard to tell. So let's start the demonstration, Ginger. All right, so for those of you who are in version four um, or version three, I think there might even be a person here in version three, they, um, you, you might um, feel a little overwhelmed by Pass Perfect, so Pass Perfect 5. So Ginger's just double-clicking on the icon and opening up the software, logging in as Rick Hilton. Now, this is the evaluation software, and Rick's password is master, so if you find yourself locked out of the evaluation, try master. And she's going to click on Start Program, which is going to open us up to the main menu of Path Perfect. So the main menu of Path Perfect, I'm going to point out the areas we're going to be dealing with in Path Perfect, um, starting here in the catalogs, objects, photos, archives, and library. We're also going to be talking about collection lists, which are brand new to Path Perfect 5. And then over to the right, the inventory manager. But before I talk about the inventory manager, I want to talk about a new feature in version 5 called Quick Find. If Ginger clicks on Quick Find here, it's going to call up a screen that allows us to um, find object IDs no matter what database they live in. So if they're in, uh, in objects, it's going to come up, or photos, it's going to come up. So we have a tin type here in front of us that we're going to look up. 2003.2. Ginger's over there pecking on the keyboard. She's going to click on Find. And we come to the item, um, tin type of my good buddy Armin Carter here. Um, so yeah, we have the tin type of Armin Carter, but there's another way we could have found this, and this is where that barcode comes in. So I'm going to have Ginger go back to, uh, to find. And instead of pecking on the keyboard, this time we're going to use this, uh, this barcode wand. That little beep that I hope you heard, um, what it did is it just typed in the object ID name, or the object ID number, and then um, hit the enter key on the keyboard is, is basically what this little wand just did. Uh, it's really simple. It, it reduces the, the, uh, the chances of, of typing incorrectly, of bad keyboarding. Uh, so barcoding is kind of a neat technology. But in any case, the point that I want to make while we're on this photo record is that we have some fields in Path Perfect we're going to be dealing with throughout this webinar. Starting on the right-hand side here, um, about halfway down, we have status date, status by, and status fields. Uh, a lot of inventory or, or reporting items as missing, um, this status field is going to become important to us. We'll look more at that later. We're also on the left-hand side in the sidebar, you're going to see this little green data light next to location. Uh, we're going to click on location here and see the fields that uh, are represented here. So for instance, this uh, Armin's uh, image is tintype is in Path Perfect Museum Archives Cabinet 2 photo storage box number one right now. It was last inventoried in dun, 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 6 2000 uh, by Pat Wilson, of which I am sure is three or four of our collections managers ago. So that's the uh, the fields that we're going to be uh, updating. Now if we were dealing I'm sorry that first type of inventory we were talking about, kind of this workflow inventory where you're going to be updating inventory information as you go through your daily routines. The way we would do that is pretty simple. We click on edit, go down to the last inventory date field, and put our cursor in there, and then hit the, and, and most of you know this from training, hit the F8 key on your keyboard and it should bring up today's date. And then likewise we can go into the inventory by field right-click or F7 to get into the authority file, and then double-click on my name in order to select that, that selection for the field. So by updating the records as you go through your, um, through your yearly routine, you may be able to reduce the number of items that you really need to inventory at the end of the year. Also, by updating those locations, it's going to make it easier to reconcile your complete inventory if you keep good records. And that's just simple editing in Path Perfect. Now, we talked about, <coughs> excuse me, we talked about barcodes and barcode um, printing. I'd like to show you how to create the barcode label for uh, this image. And Ginger's going to click on Print here, and then uh, going to select the barcode label, and then Preview. 
Now this is set up to, um, to print on an Avery 5160 label. Um, if you've already used number one in the Avery 5160, uh, on the Avery 5160 sheet, you can tell it to select start in position two. So we can save some labels if we're going to be printing labels one at a time. So that's great. We can print out one label, attach it to, um, to our tintype here, or attach it to the um, outside of the mylar sleeve of our tintype. Uh, more on that in a minute. But what if, what if we want to print out all of the items that we expect to find in storage location photo storage box one? So let's go out of, out of the photos catalog back to the main menu of Path Perfect. And from here, we're going to go into the research area, click on all four catalogs, and then do a query for the home container field. Contains text, or begins with is fine for this one too, photo storage box one. Now again, you notice that uh, A in the upper right-hand corner here, we can go into the authority file and select photo storage box one. Once Ginger selects that, she's going to click on Add to Statement and then Run Query. And if this goes just like the other two times we practiced it, it will show 30 records on this list. All right, so that's all of our records. Or I'm sorry, these are the database records that are supposed to be in the uh, photo storage box one. All right, so we're going to print this off and uh, and show you the barcode labels in the entire sheet. So go ahead and preview. Now this could take a few seconds here because we have to resize all of those images to print them on this barcode sheet. But once that comes up, you should see a series of barcode labels. There you go. All right. Good job. So we can print them and we can go on and do our uh, our barcode labeling project now that we have this barcode inventory that, or this barcode label printing that is included in the inventory manager. So that's how we can generate those labels. Go ahead and close out of there, Jen. Let's get back out to um, the main menu. So by way of a quick review here, and we'll just stay on the screen for a second, but what we've done so far is we've gone in, we've learned how to use Quick Find, so we can quickly locate items. We learned how to print barcode labels by going to the Print button, selecting the barcode label, and then we can also print for an entire location for our barcode inventorying, inventorying project. Um, we can print out an entire location by searching all four catalogs and then printing off the search results. All right, so the next thing I want to do, because this project that we're getting ready to embark on is that we're going to print, we're going to print out an inventory list, and then after the person returns back to us that list filled out with the items that were found and the items that were not found, we're going to massively update the records in Pass Perfect. So before I do any sort of mass or global update in Pass Perfect, I want to make a backup of my data. So we do that from the main menu, clicking on Hard Drive Backup, and then clicking on Backup Data to Hard Drive. What this does, if you're on a network, this is taking a copy of the data that's on the server, zipping it up, and putting it on your local hard drive. We recommend doing this once a day, but also before you do anything drastic like global updates, which is really what we're doing here with PassPerfect's uh, inventory manager in some cases when we're updating records. So that's made, that's great. If we have any problems, we screw things up or we do something weird that we don't like, this is our life preserver to get back to where we were at uh, 120, uh, 120, yeah, 1324, 124 this afternoon. All right, exit from there. Great, so now we're at the place, Ginger, where we wanna create our first inventory list. Um, the goal here is to create a checklist of all items that are supposed to be in photo storage box one. So pretend with me that that little barcoding project we just did, it happened a few months ago. And we put all of those items into, um, we, we put all of those items into storage box one. But now we need to do our inventory, so we're going to go back and generate a checklist of all of the items that are supposed to be in storage box number one. 
We start with doing by doing this by going over to the inventory manager button. I think this is the first time we've been in this screen. This is the product that we're talking about today, the inventory manager product. Down at the bottom, you have your two buttons. And before we go into either one of them, that create inventory list, that's strategy one. And the import list, that's strategy two. Right now, we're working on strategy number one, creating a list that someone's going to take out and find the items. So click on create inventory list. And let's get into the options that we have for narrowing down our list. Now, like I said, we're going to be doing a, a certain activity here, but while we're here, let me explain some of these options. If we were only inventorying items that were in the objects, we would take the check marks out of the photos, archives, and library. For my example, we're going to leave those in, because if the item was misclassified into the libraries or library or archives, but it is in my photo box, I still want it to be on my checklist. Second is the only status. If we were doing an inventory trying to find all of the stuff that was listed as missing, we could run a report by selecting status. We can go into the authority file here and select missing by double-clicking on it. Now, Ginger looks at me and she says, we're not doing that. All right, good enough. We won't do that. So then only collection uh, is another option here if you were doing it only by a certain collection. But this last choice down here is the one we really want. We could do items in all locations, which would give us everything, or we could do items in a selected location and then click on select location. And here we're looking for items that only um, are in photo storage box one. Now, for our example, because this is an eval software, we can be as um, lackadaisical as just putting photo storage box one in container without putting in any sort of uh, what building it's in, home location, or those other things. Because in our collection, we only have one photo storage box one. Okay? So we're going to click on OK here. Now, we've selected only one location. What are these other options? Well, I'm going to skip over the red section and go down to the yellow section first. This yellow section allows me to select my sampling criteria. Criteria. Remember how we talked before about the complete wall-to-wall -wall inventory versus doing an assessment? Well, those second two choices, by choosing a percentage of the collection or a fixed number of items, allow us to take a random sample of our collection to see how our... Um, how our database is matching up to our real inventory. Um, for this example, because we want to do a complete inventory of the uh, photo storage box number one, we're going to leave all items selected. All right, so now um, we'll go ahead and click on create. Oh, I'm sorry, the, I, the section in the center, center here would exclude the items from the list. Um, I'm choosing to exclude these. For many organizations, you would not exclude these. You still want to do an inventory if the item is on exhibit, part of an incoming loan, or part of an outgoing loan, um, just to confirm that those items haven't been on outgoing loan for the last 27 years. So click on Create List Now, and you'll see that we've created a new catalog list with 30 records. Click on OK, and we'll be back in the Catalog List Manager where you'll see the inventory list generated and gives a date and time um, you'll notice we're already in the inventory control folder. All right, Jim, so what are we going to do next here? We're going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to change the name. Okay, so with this, uh, this list we generated here, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty vague name. But it's a list that was generated. Uh, you'll also see there's a little lock next to it. We're going to unlock this list so that we can make changes to it, and we're going to change the name. So we do that by clicking on Change List Name or Parameters and change the name. And for this case, in this case, I think we want to call it Photo Storage Box 1. And we'll leave the date and time in there so we, uh, so we have it. And then unlock and then save. All right, so once we've got the, uh, the list selected there, I'm sorry, the list created and we've changed the name of it, um, let's double click that list and see what's on it. All right, so this is a listing of the all 30 items that are on this uh, inventory list. Um, and from here, we're going to have the opportunity to print out inventory worksheets. Now, there's three different inventory worksheets that you're going to see here. That in print inventory worksheet, by the way, was in the lower left-hand corner if you missed that part. 
uh, lower left-hand corner says print inventory worksheets. You have the ability to uh, print out an inventory checklist, which um, well, let's take a look at it, let's preview it. This is actually the one we are going to print for our volunteer to go and do the inventory for us. Um, this, this is an inventory checklist, very basic information like the object ID, object name, and then some fields that can be filled out by hand. This report will hold about 32 records per page. 32 records per page. So if you have an inventory of, uh, say, a thousand items, you're going to need about 33 pages in order to, uh, to do that inventory to print it out. Another option is your inventory checklist with images. And this option has a little bit more information, like what cabinet and box it's, or, and storage box it's supposed to be in, uh, also what the status is, but it also has a thumbnail, which is really great for identifying those items that, that perhaps the, uh, the number has worn off or the number has fallen off of the artifact. So this is the, uh, the middle section, the middle selection of these list choices that we have there, which is the inventory checklist with images. We also have the inventory full worksheet. This is the one that takes up the most paper. That last list, we, we could put about 11 records per page. So again, our 1,000 item inventory is going to take up 100 pages or close to it. This one, you're only going to get two or three records per page, which means that you're now going to use up almost a whole ream of paper in order to uh, print out your inventory. But the benefit is, uh, you can make inventory notes on this form. You can uh, put in additional information. There's a lot of information that's provided to you, including a description. So these are the three options we have. But the option that we chose was to print the uh, inventory checklist, which we then handed to our volunteer, and we'll call him Mr. Gomez for now, um, and handed to him and told him to go off and do the inventory. So we're going to exit all the way out of here and come back to the main menu of Pass Perfect. All right, so after, um, after a few hours, days, months of work, um, this person, Mr. Gomez, has returned the, uh, the document that we handed him, this inventory module checklist, and this is what we see. Now, besides the obvious questions of why did you have a highlighter and a marker out in the collections facility, uh, our other concerns are that, uh, that we have two items here, both highlighted and said not in box. So these items are missing. Now, we need to reconcile this in our past perfect database. Remember, we sent them out with a list, and now we need to ed edit the data in past perfect. So those two items are 1999.1.2 and 1999.1.10. And I'm sure Ginger's going to remember that. So let's go ahead and close out of here, get back into Pass Perfect, and let's use our quick find to get to those records. All right, so this is the first item that was not found. Um, we need to change things like status date, who the status is by, and what the status is. So go ahead and click on Edit, Ginger, and let's go into the status date and give it today's date by clicking F8 on the keyboard. Status by, we'll go into the authority file. And once we see the authority file come up, we'll double click to select my name. And then status, we're going to go with, uh, actually, a good point I want to make here is we used to have just missing OK on loan and those things. I added a new status, and I recommend this practice now that, I've, that I, we've worked through it here a couple of times. Just because an item is missing out of its home location doesn't necessarily mean that it's missing yet. And I would reserve that missing for items that you're pretty sure are missing. So I created a missing INDN 2012. That tells me during this inventory process, this item hasn't been found yet. It just gives me a second tier of items that I can search for or items that I, that I think are kind of maybe teetering on the edge of peril. Um, inventory... To th because it starts with the word missing, um, they can both be searched for and called up on the same list. But I like this, this uh, function, missing inventory 2012. So that's the status we're going to give it. All right. So let's go ahead and save this record and go make the same changes to 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ginger pointed out that this. Remember that storage list, this uh, photo storage box one list. We went down on the sidebar, clicked on list, and we want to take it off of the list. And the reason we're doing this is we have 30 items on that um, on that inventory list, and for 28 of them, I want to say, hey, the thing is fine. It's been inventoried and it's good to go. But for these two items, I want to take them off the list because I've already manually gone in here and said, hey, this item's missing in our inventory. So we're going to use that red X that Ginger's clicking on and click on yes, remove this item from the list. Now remember, this is removing the item from the list, not removing the list from the, or not removing the item from the collection. That would be that big delete button at the top, which we say you're never supposed to use. Yep. Ginger's going to move on to the next one now, 1999.1.10. I don't know how she remembers that stuff. And we're going to do the same, uh, same status deal and remove it from the list. Now, there are questions coming in while we're teaching the class. I'm sorry we don't have an extra staff member here to be able to answer them. I promise you I will... Um, I will come back to answer them all before I let you uh, before I let you go. All right, so Ginger's now going through, change the status, and also uh, remove these items from the list. And next, we want to go and do a mass update to that list. So, if we go out to catalog lists and click on the folder for our inventory control. And then take a look at our list for photo storage box number one. We can get into this list to see those now 28 items, right? Because two of them have been removed. We also have, now we have some ability here on the left-hand side, the thing that's right above print inventory worksheet, is to mark as inventoried, right? So, what day do we inventory? It's bringing up today's date. And because we're logged in as Rick Hilton through security, that's why um, it's giving his information. But Ginger, let's make that me. I'll be inventorying today. All right. Now, the person who did the inventory, uh, Mr. Gomez, or whoever that was, that volunteer, that is whose name probably should be in this inventory by. If you're the person that's responsible for the inventory but you're delegating, you could also put your name in here if you thought that was more appropriate. So inventory date has been changed for all of the records on the list, and then click on OK. And that's it. And we can, uh, we can then put strategy number one to bed. We print out a list. We go look for the items. The things that we find missing, we come up back in and we update their status. Let's move on to strategy number two. Um, Strategy number two is about going out and scanning the items or finding the items that are in that storage location and then bringing that list and updating it in PathPerfect. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up Notepad. And you're going to have to pretend with me for a second here that we've, had, we've sent Ginger off with a different laptop to go off um, and put in all the object IDs of the items that are found in photo storage box number three. So she's going to start typing them in here. Faster, please, if you could. She's laughing at me like, no way, I can't type any faster. This is a real pain. I've got to be accurate. Right. Well, let's, let's do this then. Let's switch over. Since these items are barcoded, let's go through and scan them in as I talk. Maybe that will go faster. All right. So this is the beauty of barcode inventory. If you can barcode your items, this is how quick you can start doing your inventory. Um, You'll notice here that a couple of these things are not like the others. The object IDs have leading zeros in them. These are items that haven't been relabeled in our um, – they haven't been relabeled, though they have been renumbered. We took away the uh, leading zeros years ago, but these two items still have the leading zeros in their barcode. So they're going to be problematic. You're going to see that later. Wow, you're done? Awesome. Okay, so we've uh, created this list. Now, saving this list, and this is key to organization, we want to say what this list is in its, um, in its file name. So what do you want to call this? Items found box three, and then maybe today's date. And we're going to save this right to the desktop so it's easy to find uh, three. Yeah. So we're going to save this on our desktop 
So it's easy to find. Um, you're going to have to pretend with me that we transfer this file from Ginger's laptop that we sent her out into the collection with to back to our presentation laptop. All right, so now we've got this file. Now, there were a couple keys to that, to that uh, notepad file. One is it's plain text. Two is every object ID had its own line separated by a carriage return. And that's it. Passport can't deal with it if you start putting notes in there because we can't tell where an object ID stops and where your notes start. So just a list of object IDs. All right, so now we're back in Passport. We're back at the main computer, and we're ready to bring in that inventory list. So let's go to Inventory Manager and take a look at strategy button number two, Import List. So. Um, this is giving us some notes here on what we're or what we're supposed to do with that file. I just told you all about it. Trust me, or read it either way. View list before importing is checked because I want to verify that the items I think I'm bringing in are what I'm bringing in. Click on import list now, and we're going to get prompted for finding that file. Ginger knows exactly where it is, even though I have a ton of stuff on my desktop. So items found box. Uh, yeah, box three, and that's the date. That's the right one. And there it is. Just gives us a preview of it. You can see those two, what I expect are going to be problem records. Go ahead and click on import, Ginger. Let's see what happens. So once we click on import, Pass Perfect is going to go through, and it's going to try to find each one of those object IDs. And when it finds an object ID in your notepad file that is not in Pass Perfect, it's going to call that an exception, and you're going to have the opportunity to view that list. Click yes. These are the two items that were in the notepad document, but not in your past perfect collection. So if you click on save as text file, watch what happens. It takes that same file and just appends not found.txt to the end of it, and you can click on OK. Now you can go back later and open that text file and reconcile this problem. What is wrong with this file or that, I didn't ha that it didn't match up with Path Perfect? Then you can go back to your artifacts and relabel, renumber them, or correct your database if that was the problem. Now, if Ginger would have had a sloppy typing, one of those problems could have been that she recorded an object ID typing that really didn't exist. Um, so anyway, that can happen. All right, so now we've got this, um, this photo storage box one file. I'm sorry, this photo storage box or file, uh, items found box three file. It's the top one with 15 items in it. You watch to scan those 15 items. Um, for this example, because we, we're not so concerned, or I'm sorry, because we know these items are in a certain storage location and our plan is to leave them in that storage location no matter what their current location is, we're going to update all of the items on, on that list to live in the same location. So we double click to enter into this items found area and then we click on change location button. And this change location button is what allows us to do the global update on all of the records that uh, we're going to be changing. Now, if we wanted to blank out all home locations here, we would just put check marks the whole way down. And this would overwrite anything on those records with blank data. Now, you would never do this. But it is important to know that by doing this, we are going to erase information about, like, for instance, if one of these images was used to be in one of our rooms hanging on a certain wall, and that information um, was old and outdated, we wouldn't want to leave that information in the current home location. We'd want to move it to location history. So bear with me. I think this will become pretty, pretty clear. We're going to be in, um, let's see, we're going to be in the Past Perfect Archives building. Uh, so Ginger is double-clicking and going into the authority file to select these guys. Uh, cabinet 2. And down for container, this is going to be a photo storage box three. So the authority file makes this a lot faster to, uh, to select. Um, highly recommend it. Take a look down there at the bottom. Uh, there's an inventory date, last inventory date, and inventory by. We can also update that information here rather than making this a two-step process. We can do it all from one screen. Also notice I did not change any temporary location information. I didn't want to overwrite that temporary location information. I'm leaving it alone for now. 
So if an item was listed as temporary location, I'm leaving it alone. So we're going to click on Change Locations. You're about to change location for 15 items on the list. Are you ready? I sure am. All right. So they've, uh, they've been changed. Now it's asking me, do you want to record the previous home locations in the location history file? And I'm going to say yes to this 99.9% .9 of the time, that yes, I do want to keep history of where this item was stored previously. All right, so uh, 15 records uh, locations have been updated. Click on OK, and then we can exit back out from here. And double-click on any one of those records. Ginger, I'm sorry, I kind of got you out too far here. So double-click on any one of those records, and you'll see now that it is in storage location Box three. See it down there at the bottom? All right. So this tool, this tool for um, being able to go out and scan items, bring them into a list, and then do a mass update on it, what a great tool if you have a massive move to do. If you know you're going to take everything off of shelf three and put it over in closet eight, you could do that with Inventory Manager. It helps you move stuff globally. All right, so we updated the location information, and uh, we, we brought in a list, um, and we talked about that being a move. All right, so let's uh, back out of here, and let's get rid of both of these lists so we can come in from our new, uh, we'll come in and we'll, we'll kind of create them again. We're running out of time here, but I'm going to go a little bit long in the lecture. Uh, I'll stick around for questions and answers, but I think, uh, I think it's worth doing here. So we'll go ahead and clear out both of these lists, Ginger. Um, if you try to delete a list that has a lock, um, it's going to tell you that uh, you don't have permission to do it, so Ginger's going to unlock it first. And I'm just getting rid of these lists because I want uh, just a clean slate that's easier to understand. All right, so Ginger, do me a favor. Let's create, um, create uh, the list of items, the checklist of items of everything that's in storage box three. So let's pretend we're a couple of months in the future now and we want to pr do another inventory and we want to generate a list of all of the items that's supposed to be in storage box three. And while she's doing that, I'm going to take a couple items out of her pile here that she's getting ready to scan and put another item in that she's not expecting. We'll see if she can find it with this. All right, so Jen just generated a list with 15 records, and she could double-click on that to print the inventory uh, list that you saw before. She prints the checklist and sends it off with Mr. Gomez to go and do the inventory of that item. He is going to find the item that is missing, right? Because when he goes through his checklist, he's going to find that that item was not there. Now, Ginger, in the meantime has gone over to that storage location, and she is now scanning in each one of the items. And um, for this example, it's a little bit silly because we don't have that many items in that storage location that if, um, if we sent Mr. Gomez over there first, he would have said, you know what, this item wasn't on my list, but it was in there, and he might have written it down. But if we were doing an entire room or a very large area, um, we might not kind of have that reconciliation that we, we would be able to do it in our heads while we were there. So. Um, in this case, we are going to uh, – sorry, sorry, she's moving quickly, and, and uh, I'm trying to move quickly as well. So we're going to go ahead and save this. So this is stuff we found in full in, – yeah, found in items. And again, she's putting the date in here. All right, so good? Yeah, sure. All right, so what we've done is we've saved the um, file or basically transferred it back over to our past perfect computer. And now let's import that list. I'm glancing over at the questions board. Great questions coming in. Stay tuned. I will get to them, I promise. All right, so she's importing her file. Um, 
it says it has two object IDs that didn't match. Again, those are the object IDs that if we print preview that list, we're going to see them. They're the ones with the leading zeros. Okay, so we have that file that we have to deal with. We've got to clean that up. All right, good enough. If exceptions have been saved and close. And let's go look at our uh, Yeah. So no, it's fine, Ginger. Um, one thing you'll notice here is even though Ginger had accidentally, when she was doing the barcode scanning, or even if she was typing this in, she accidentally put the same one in there twice. Um, it's, it's no harm, no foul. Past perfect is only going to make it's going to make the change to the record, but it's only going to make it once. So there is a reason why she has 16 on one list and 15 on the other. Um, all right, Ginger. So we've got two lists here. One is what we thought we were going to find. And then the other one is the list that we actually found. So I want to do a subtract list to see if there are any items we found that are not on our uh, inventory list. So go ahead and click on the Subtract List button, and it asks us what list do we want as our target list. So what list do we want to remove the records from? And that's going to be our, where is it listed there? Oh, Ginger says it's locked. We can't subtract it. We have to go edit it first. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sorry. My bad. Forgot to put that part in my steps. Um, we need to unlock these guys so we can edit them. Um, you can't subtract from lists that are locks, which is one of the questions that's on the question board. Why would you ever have a lock? Well, locking lists allows... Um, unlock both. All right. So uh, locking lists allows you to um, to protect lists that you create from other users in Past Perfect. You can lock lists so they can't be seen. You can also lock lists so they can be viewed but not added or removed from. So Ginger's unlocked both our lists so we can work with them. And we're going to take the list that we actually found items, and we're going to take away from it the list that we thought was supposed to be there. Yeah, so we're going to take 16 minus 15, click on Subtract Records. Are you sure you want to do this? I'm going to click on Yes. And that's what's left. Only one record from the source list were not on the target list. So click on OK and close. And let's go view that item. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the double-click item. So that is correct, actually. That's the item that um, that we... It was in the box, but we didn't expect it to be there. It's in the wrong location. Um, and if you take a look, I think under location, yeah, it's supposed to be in storage box one, but the inventory we did was storage box three. So I realize that was fast and maybe blowing your mind a little bit after everything else that you just learned, but I wanted to show you the power of being able to merge and subtract lists to help with getting that beach ball up the hill. Okay, so that's about all we have time for to talk about with inventory. Let's do a quick summary here, if you can get me to that slide. So, Path Perfect Inventory Manager, um, doing an inventory is essential to all collecting organizations. Uh, it's either mandated by someone else that you have to do it, or you should feel compelled to do it for all of the benefits that you get from having a good inventory. Um, we don't remove the inventory process. That process is a very human process. We're just trying to turn the boulder into a beach ball. Let's make this easier to do. Let's make it more efficient so that you don't feel like it's a huge hill with a huge boulder. It's like a day at the beach, really. Um, Path Perfect Inventory Manager um, is available for version 5.0. Um, we did not build an inventory manager for version 4 because back then we didn't have catalog lists. Catalog lists were not available in version 4. Uh, they are available in version 5. Um, and that's why we have inventory manager only for version 5. The cost is $236 for AASLH institutional members, $295 for non-members. What did I say? Oh, the cost, yeah, the price prices for the inventory manager. Thanks, Ginger. So the inventory manager's cost is $236. Um, and then there's samples available at our um, at our website as well as quick start guides. And I, I hope to have this presentation up there as soon as possible. 
um, that you'll be able to watch the same presentation, hopefully, uh, from the uh, same website. Don't go get busy writing all this information down. In about two hours, we're going to send out an automated uh, email that's going to have a link to that page as well as our contact information. When you're ready to order Inventory Manager or if you have any questions or if you have questions about Path Perfect in general, please don't hesitate to contact either Ginger or I. 1-800-562-6080 um, is our uh, phone number. Ginger's email is there. My email is the same, except, except it says Brian. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up. So I'm going to answer questions here that are coming, that are coming in. Um, if you have to go, uh, as time is running out here, um, thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, we we um, you know, hope that you can, you can utilize the, uh, the software. And, uh, and yeah, thanks again. All right, so now we'll start with these questions. Um, for those people who, uh, who are leaving, again, thanks for coming. We'll start with, uh, start with the first one. Package only available for version 5. Yes, it is. PassPerfect uh, version 5 is the only place that Inventory Manager will work. Um, what scans the barcode? Well, um, that little barcode wand is what scans the barcode. Let me see if I can get us there. Um, all right. So after the beach ball, there we go. So the image that's going to be coming up on your screen in a second shows a little barcode wand. Um, you may have seen this if you've done checkout at the supermarket or at Sam's Club or any place else when you have a big item. They pull the wand out and they scan uh, the item that's on the bottom of the cart. Same idea. It plugs right into your USB drive of your computer, and it, um, it acts sort of like a keyboard that when you scan something that is a barcode, it interprets that barcode code to become keyboard strokes, and then you can program an enter key in after that. So every time you pull the trigger, it says, what's it say under here? If it can read it, it reads it, and then puts in an enter key. So that is the uh, device, better known as a barcode scanner, that, um, that scans. There are several types of devices. One is a wand. Avoid the wand. The wand looks like, a, well, a magic wand. It looks like a pen or a pencil, and uh, it has a light shooting out the end of it, and you swipe it across your item. Two reasons you don't want to do that. One is you don't want to come in contact with your barcode. You'll wear it out. Second reason is it's very unreliable. It does not read near as well. Go with the, um, with the handheld trigger type barcode scanner as you see in this picture. All right, so how would you mark an item that is in the box but not on the list? Um, if you're going to do the, the strategy one inventory, what I would do is I would print out um, small enough lists that people could easily um, determine the items that are in the box as well as the items that are not in the box. So the, uh, if you think about it as a small photo, photo file, maybe they took all the photos out of the file and then one by one place them in as they go through the checklist. What's left in their hand afterwards, they would hand write on the bottom of the checklist and then you would get, get it into your database that way. Or you can use that advanced strategy we showed, which um, does both, where, where you scan in all the items that are in your inventory location, as well as print out a checklist. That gives you what's missing, as well as what you have extra. Um, the question's about how to get into the authority file. In PassPerfect, when you're in a field that has authority file access, um, let me see if I can show this to you real quick on the screen. So I'm just going to get back into Pass Perfect at the main menu, go to the Photos data table. And once I'm inside of Photos, if I click on Edit and put my cursor in any field that has an authority file, like Status By, you're going to see this, uh, this A icon at the top of the screen. That is your authority file icon that tells you that an authority file is present. If you hit F7 on your keyboard, you'll get into the authority file. And then you can click on this plus if you need to add your name. Put your name, please. Yeah. Can't see that far. There it is, Peter Pan. All right. 
So that's how you can add to your authority files. Does the inventory manager keep track of people who have inventoried in the past? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. If you go to location and take a look at this last inventory date, and I forgot to mention this during the presentation, I'll have to add that for the next time. This little folder here is what allows you to see items that were inventoried in the past. So we did this twice today, at 20 after and then 20 till. Um, that's the two inventories that are in, in here. We don't have a whole lot of inventory history in our evaluation software because this database wasn't available until version 5. Um, a person asked about why we did away with leading zeros. Um, two reasons we did away with leading zeros. One is we found that most museums did not like leading zeros. Um, I like them personally because I think they give nice structure to an object ID. Uh, the reason most organizations did not like them is because they made for much larger uh, representations of a number on an artifact, which I can understand. Uh, in the early days, we required leading zeros. We do not now because we came up with a way to do numeric sorting, even though it's not a real number field. If you're using uh, leading zeros and you don't have any reason to stop using leading zeros, please keep using them. And if you're not using leading zeros, please don't switch to them. Um, it's best to stay consistent. How do you create an authority file? We kind of went over that. Authority files, um, you don't actually create the authority file itself, but you can add entries to your authority files. Uh, I got called away. Will this, available, will this webinar be available later? The answer is yes, we will try to have this available later. We are recording it, uh, so you're going to hear me say that again. We are recording it. We are recording it. Um, Hopefully we get this out. I've never really presented one of these things um, for free access online. That's what I want to do. But if we can't uh, provide free access online for this webinar, um, we will provide it on CD uh, for participants who ask for it. So um, watch for it over the next couple of days. If you don't see it and you want it, let me know. What's the purpose of the lock function on the list? Uh, like I said, with security enabled, um, you can make a list so it is locked or unlocked so that you can have other people either able or not able to, um, to update the records on that list. That doesn't mean they can't change the status. It just means that they can't add or remove those items from that list. Um, think of it as items that you know need to be um, uh, or, or let's say items that you have selected that you're thinking about putting on exhibit and someone else comes in and says, you know, I don't know why that's on that list. I'm just going to take it off. Well, you know, if you can't lock your list, that's a distinct possibility. That's why we have that lock feature. Mm. And great question about uh, container lists. Um, we have not built into uh, this software the ability to do anything with container lists from the archives. Um, I'm not really even sure, thinking off the top of my head here, how that would work. So let me work on that some more and think about it. And if it's something that can come up in the future, let's talk about it. Uh, Lisa asks about, I'm sorry, Ingrid asks about, um, about leading zeros. Um, all of, uh, all of her stuff has leading zeros. Uh, Ingrid, this is probably something that we want to talk one-on-one -on -one with, kind of really get into what your situation is and decide you know, how you're going to go forward with it. Um, my best recommendation is if the artifacts that you have have leading zeros and your catalog has leading zeros, leave it alone and keep using leading zeros. Um, if there's some ambiguity to some of the, the artifacts, don't have leading zeros, but your database does, then we can start talking about removing those leading zeros from the database. But you don't want your artifacts to have different numbers than what is in your database. Is there a barcoder that we can recommend? The barcode ones that we use, we actually went um, to try to find out if the cheapest ones were any good. We went on to Google and just um, looked for the cheapest ones we could find. The ones we got were ID Tech, ID Tech, um, I D T E C H. Um, they were, 
I want to say they were $19.95 each, although they may have been $29.95 each. Not very expensive uh, for these little barcode wands. But a word of warning, when you're printing barcode labels, you don't want to be doing it on a cheap printer, nor do you want to be set to draft. You want to create um, crisp, good uh, barcodes for your items. Otherwise, they might not be readable. Does, the bar, does this product come with, um, with the hardware, the barcode reader? The answer is no. We do not package hardware with our software. And the reason for that is it just creates a lot of overhead for us. Um, we have to deal with returns and the, the other things. There's already companies out there who will do that. Um, then they're going to be able to do it cheaper than we can do it. Uh, we have had no experience with a barcode wand that we have purchased, and we've purchased them five different times, um, that did not work with uh, PassPerfect and with our software. Um, the thing that you want to be careful of is what kind of plug is on the end of that barcode scanning uh, trigger device wand thing. Um, this is a barcode, this barcode scanner, if it has a USB plug and you have a USB port available, that's great. Don't buy one that has a keyboard plug if you're using a modern laptop, because most modern laptops don't have keyboard plugs any longer. Um, the, I believe the leader in this market, and, and again, I'm not doing any advertising here, um, but I believe the leader in the barcode reading market is WASP, W-A-S-P, but um, do your own research, find one, give it a try. If you need me to try it out for you first, I can always use another one. Let me know. Uh, thanks for coming, thanks for coming, thanks for coming. Does it come with a barcode scanner? I think I answered that. Uh, somebody says, uh, and I think this is a quick find. So um, Jackie asks, uh, we have version 5, however, we do not have Quick Start. Any idea why? The answer to that is probably you haven't updated your version 5. Uh, 5.0 B7 is what's available on the web right now. And especially if you're in early versions of 5, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you update. If you have trouble updating PassPerfect, call my staff here at the support office. They are quite helpful. Um, there's new features, there's bug fixes, there's lots of reasons to update, not the least of which is your quick find. How do you use an iPad or iPhone? That's a great question. I have neither an iPad or an iPhone, but I do have an Android tablet. And that Android tablet, which is the only tablet um, that I've seen out there that has one, so there may be others, um, I have an Acer. Uh, an Acer um, Android tablet. It has a USB port on the side that I can plug my wand into, and I love it. I can take my tablet and uh, plug my wand into it, and then um, and I call, I call it a wand. It's not really a wand. It's a trigger device. But I plug it in, my barcode device, into the, this thing, and I call up a text document, and I just go out there and scan and scan and scan. Um, it puts it all into my file. I can name that file, and then I have to transfer that file back over to my computer, either by sending it by email or putting it on a USB drive, um, whatever works for you, to bring that back to the other to my computer that has PassPerfect. Um, Adam, who also works here, um, has an iPad. And he had to buy a device, I think from Apple, though he may have bought the uh, cheap knockoff one uh, that creates a USB drive from his Apple port, which allows him to do the same thing. For those of you who use, um, like, uh, I think it's called Redline or something like that, that allows your camera to act like a barcode scanner, that can work as well, although I found that it's quite clunky, that I feel like I'm having to click 17 buttons all to scan an object ID that's only 16 characters long, which I can find kind of frustrating. So I do like the, uh, the, the idea of using the barcode scanner device attached to my, um, my iPad, or in my case, my Android tablet. Uh, like I said, the, uh, the scanners are really inexpensive. Um, do a Google search and you will find them. Uh, ID, ID, T, ID Tech, ID Tech is the, um, is the last one we chose because they were the cheapest that we could find. Um, there's probably an advantage to buying a $175 one. I just don't know what it is. Uh, it could be the range of how far away you have to be from the item. 
but really for as little as we use these things compared to maybe a cashier at a supermarket, I don't think it's that big of a deal. As long as you don't have to be in physical contact with the, ID, with the item, I'm thinking less is more by a couple of them. Um, Brianna asks about the uh, leading zeros. Past perfect does not dictate whether you should or should not have leading zeros. You want to follow um, appropriate collections management policies on this leading zero thing. If your items have leading zeros, then your database should have leading zeros. If your database has leading zeros but your items do not, it's going to make it more complicated to do things like inventory. So um, your artifacts should match your database records and whether or not you use leading zeros is up to you. Can you use inventory manager with temporary custody records? Um, temporary custody records by their, um, by their definition are not in our four catalogs, objects, photos, archives, and library. Their um, temporary custody generally in past perfect is more of a description of items and you'll see them listed here. If I go into temporary custody, the description here will tell you about the item. There's no catalog record attached to this. So you can't really use Inventory Manager with temporary custody uh, because those items have not been assigned a number or a barcode. Where can we get the scanners? Go online, uh, do a, uh, I, I did a Google search for it to, uh, to find. Um, and once you go do a Google search, there's a shopping link. Um, maybe we can go and look real quick. Uh, can I show you? Yeah, I can't actually, the browser window I have open is the one I'm using for this meeting, so I can't really show you. Um, do the, uh, do the Google search. Once you do the Google search for barcode scanner, um, and maybe you do ID tech or whatever your, um, your brand that you want to look for is, and then click on the shopping link under Google, and uh, it'll give you a good place to start. If multiple people are using PassPerfect, who has the authority to unlock the list? Great question. If you created the list, you can unlock them. If you did not create the list, you cannot unlock them unless you log in as the person who did. So uh, as long as you're logged in as the person who created the list, you can unlock them. How do I change location history? The system automatically puts in previous locations, but the by and until, uh, but, but not the by and until. I would like to add that information. If you double click on that, I believe you can make those changes. Let's take a look. So under photos and then location. Find something that has a location history like this thing. If I double click, it brings up a uh, location history. If I click on edit, I can make changes in here. And again, it has some authority file fields to use while you're doing that. So if you have a false location information history, you can delete those records or edit those records to make them correct. Do I, uh, James asks, do I um, print barcodes on a dedicated barcode printer, a zebra, et cetera? Um, I prefer not to because of the cost associated with those devices, and I have found that um, those type of devices tend to wear out faster than my regular printers, and they cost almost as much, if not just as much. So I use my regular color laser printer. Uh, you could use just a regular black and white laser printer. I like the color because um, our barcodes by default have those thumbnails on them, which makes it a little bit easier to match up the photograph that fell out of its sleeve to the sleeve it belongs in. Um, but yes, you can print on a dedicated printer. I choose to go with the Avery 5160 solution because it's less expensive and easier for me to use. Uh, there, is additional, there is additional configuration stuff you're going to need to do to your labels um, before you can use them with one of those Zebra functions. We are set up to print to the default printer in the Avery 5160 style. So you, you might need help with that. You're going to want to contact us if you're doing it. Um, James points out that very inexpensive readers don't read all symbologies. I agree with that, although I haven't found one, even on the cheapest end, that doesn't read the things we're talking about, which are the, uh, the, the basic simple two-dimensional barcode readers that are reading either code 39 or code 128, which are the two main options you have with PassPerfect. Even these really, really cheap models uh, seem to accept that with no trouble at all, has been my experience. 
But again, if you want me to check out a barcode wand for you, a barcode scanning device for you, um, I'd be happy to do so. Just send me the specs on, on what you're looking at, and I can look into it for you if you'd like. My iPhone has a built-in scanner. Could I read the barcodes and upload them to Pass Perfect on it? Uh, maybe, yes. Um, if, you can, if you can take a barcode and turn it into text with your phone and create a list of those things, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to take that information and import it into Pass Perfect. Um, I don't have an iPhone. I can't tell you exactly how I would do it with the software that you're going to be using, um, but yes, if you can scan it and turn it into a text document, you are golden for bringing that into Pass Perfect. Is the adhesive on the barcode safe for objects? Judy, absolutely not. Um, I would never trust any manufacturer who says, yes, this is safe for all items. Um, be really careful here. We recommend putting, um, putting the barcodes on, your, on the outside of your acid-free box, on your acid-free tag, on your Mylar sleeve, uh, totally out of contact with anything in your collection. You've got a few different things going on here. One is the adhesive, another is the paper the adhesive is on, and then the third thing is the ink. Uh, or toner that is, is on the uh, paper. So you've got a number of different parts here that you have to be concerned about, and we would not advocate uh, attaching uh, barcode labels to any of your items, um, only to the things that house those items. Um, Daniel uh, asks if it... Um, if it's possible to print out a condition report worksheet as well. Um, I think better, Daniel, and, and I apologize here, I think even better than printing out a separate worksheet for this is let's modify those reports so they have the fields that you want people to fill out while they're doing the inventory. So I think that, uh, that it's just slight modifications to the report that would give you what you need. So instead of having everything where, where you might see uh, the, the uh, person's name and the location, maybe we shrink that up to a smaller font and we add a couple of lines in there for condition uh, damage information. So a great idea. Include that location, uh, location information as well as condition information. So when you bring that stuff back to Pass Perfect to reconcile, this is again strategy one, um, you bring it back to Pass Perfect to reconcile, you've got, uh, you've got the text right there that you can, uh, that you can type into the record. The barcode printing feature is included in the inventory manager. Uh, in years past, we um, sold it separately, and I think we do still sell it separately if people want to buy it without the inventory manager, but it is included in the price of the inventory manager. You'll get the barcode printing upgrade free. All right, so I am caught up on this question board. Um, so I think that we're going to end the webinar here in a couple of minutes if no other questions come in. I want to thank, again, everyone for coming. This has been, um, actually, it's gone off really well. I appreciate all the great questions, fantastic questions. Uh, if you need any other information about Pass Perfect, this product, or anything else, please feel free to contact Ginger or I. It's ginger at museumsoftware.com or brian at museumsoftware.com. There's a staff of eight other people here that are sitting outside of my office door that will also help you. They're great people. They're here to help you any way they can. So thanks again for coming.